It's hard to believe 2024 is here. Now, let me tell you about some exciting news for our family at the end of 2023. A lot of you already know this, but my first, our Lil and my first granddaughter was born three weeks ago, so we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. And I have some tough truth for you. My granddaughter is more awesome than yours. She, she is. She's better looking than your kids. I don't care what you say. She is. I, I, I don't want to offend you, but I mean, you know, part of my job as your pastor is to share difficult truth, and, and that's just a difficult truth. I might be a little biased in that, but check out these pictures. She, she is pretty cute. Oh, yeah. I, I told them they couldn't leave those pictures up while I preach very long because you won't be paying attention to me. <laughs> Her name is Lillian Eve Greco, and we're really excited. The Lillian is a tribute to my wife, Lil, which is pretty cool. Now, yeah, my daughter and son-in-law, they wouldn't tell anybody the name before she was born, which irritated me a little bit. They're watching probably, so, but it did. I mean, I wanted to know what her name was. We didn't know what to put on stuff. So to try to guilt them a little, just a little, it was a really Christian guilting, but it was guilting nonetheless, we came up with a name for her and we named her Little Possum. We were hoping that would be obnoxious enough that they would eventually tell us the real name. They, they didn't do that. And so what I took from that is that was probably not it wasn't a bad enough name because actually now she's got a little onesie that says Awesome Possum on it. So yeah, so it was clearly a bad choice. So I told my daughter that the next time we're gonna call it Cockroach. That just lovingly, if you don't tell us the name, it's gonna be Cockroach. I was told that I would not be allowed to visit or see any child that I call Cockroach. What I took from that conversation is I may have found a name that's irritating enough that I may get the real name next time. So that's what I'm going with. So a couple of weeks ago, we flew up there to, to see Lillian and hang out with her for a couple of days. And we took off from Houston late in the evening on a Sunday. So by the time we're coming into Washington Reagan National Airport, um, it was completely dark. It was pouring down rain. It's when those big storms were coming through. The plane is getting bounced around for about the last 25 minutes. And it was pretty rough. And as I was looking out the window, watching the rain blow by at 400 miles an hour, I realized that it wasn't bothering me, that I had peace about that moment. Now, if you've known me very long, you know that peace on an airplane is, is not something I've always had. My dad was killed in a plane crash when I was eight years old. And so for a lot of my life, I've had a terrible fear of flying. I used to fly all the time for work, and I hated it. I would just have dread. The night before, I would have nightmares about planes crashing and you know, doors blowing open at 40,000 feet and uh, all these different things. And when the plane would race down the runway to take off, I, I would think about what's going to happen. And I would listen for the sounds of subtle mechanical failure, like maybe a wing falling off, you know, just listening for that. And I would sniff the AC vent to make sure there was no smoke. Who's ever done that? Make sure there's no smoke. Yeah. So I've done all of those things. And for a long time, I had a lot of stress about that. But that's all changed. I realized sitting there, I don't have stress. I have peace even in that storm. Now, that storm was just as bumpy as any storm I've been in. The difference was, compared to 15 years ago, I now trust God in a different way than I did back then. And I have trust that he can take care of me, not just in this life, but also into eternity. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to John chapter 14. In, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is just a couple of days from the cross, and they've just celebrated the, the Lord's Supper, what we call the, the, the Last Supper, with his disciples, and he shared some pretty disturbing news with his disciples. He's told them that one of them is going to betray him and that he's going to leave them. And, and as you might expect, they're pretty nervous, they're pretty upset by this revelation about what's to come. And so Jesus comforts them a little, and he tells them that he's leaving to go back to heaven, and that eventually he will return and take them home uh, with him. And, and then he gives some really practical teaching about peace. And it was very helpful for them because their world was about to start spiraling out of control, and it's helpful for us today. Well, let's pick up Jesus' teaching about peace. This is John 14, 15 through 27. If you love me, keep my commands. That seems like an odd way to start 
with peace, but let's keep going. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with him. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All of this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid." feels like kind of an odd way to start teaching on peace. He eventually gets to this peace that he's giving them, but that's not where he starts. Four different times he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. And then he says that he will be with those who obey his commands. And that seems a little odd when we first think about it, but it makes perfect sense when you understand it because Jesus is making it very clear where true peace is found. It isn't found in the world around us. And if you've watched the news at all, you know our world is probably less stable than it's been at any point since the Cold War ended over 30 years ago. We have regional wars going in the Middle East and in Europe. And the United States is involved in both of those conflicts. And they both have the potential to spiral into bigger conflicts. The world doesn't have peace. But that makes sense. Jesus told us that 2,000 years ago. He said, until he returns, there will always be wars and rumors of wars. There's also no peace in our circumstances. And if you have been around and, and know what's going on even in our church, you know that's true. I know more people right now struggling with major health issues than maybe ever in my life. There's no peace in that. I know people that got laid off in our church just before Christmas. The financial condition of this country is, is troubling. I mean, inflation is stealing away the American dream, and things are tough. There's no peace in any of that. Our circumstances don't provide peace. But, you know, so often that's where we look. We think, you know, if only my circumstances would change. If, if only things would get better, the storm would pass, then I could have peace. If only that medical test will come back negative. If only that pregnancy test will come back positive. If only I can get that raise or that promotion at work. If only my child will stop messing up and messing up their life the way they have, then I could find peace. But here's the difficult truth. If you're waiting on a storm to pass, that may not happen. And even if it does, there may be a storm right around the corner that you don't even know is here yet. There's no peace in our circumstances. Our government cannot offer you peace, and that's irregardless of which party is in control. They cannot provide you peace. And, and Jesus said that too. He said that there will always be famine. There will always be disease. We know that's true. We've gone through those things. There is no peace in our government. But look back at what Jesus says in verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And then he says that his peace is different than the world's peace. The turbulence on that airplane flight I experienced a couple of weeks ago wasn't any less bad than it was 15 years ago. The difference was the lens through which I viewed my circumstance. Does that make sense? The circumstances were the same. I'm getting bounced around like a cheap carnival ride. But it didn't bother me because I now trust the one who is in charge of the wind and the rain. My circumstances aren't different, but the lens that I view those circumstances through has changed, and that makes all the difference in finding peace. If you want to find real peace in 2024, it starts and ends with Jesus. 
True peace isn't found in the absence of trouble and hardship. True peace comes from an internal calm that's fueled by a quiet and peaceful heart. Internal calm fueled by a quiet and peaceful heart. And knowing that Jesus is near to us is what gives us that calm and quiet heart. My daughter and her husband, they're always near my granddaughter Lily, and they're never more than a few steps away. She sleeps in a bassinet just a couple of steps from their bed. When she naps during the day, they may be in the next room, but they're close enough they can hear her cry, and if she cries, they run to her immediately and take care of whatever is going on with her. They're, they're right there. They're always near. But my three-week-old granddaughter doesn't get any peace from them being nearby because she doesn't know it. When she is at her most comfortable, when she is at her most peaceful, is when you're holding her up on your chest, and she can feel the warmth of your body, and she can hear your heartbeat. The difference is she knows you are near. You're always near, but in that moment, she knows it. And the same thing is true in our relationship with Jesus. Jesus is always near, but how we experience that nearness depends on the connection that we have to him, the strength of that connection. So if you just kind of play around at being a Christian, if you just kind of come and sing a few songs and kind of walk through the walk, but never really get changed by Jesus, you're never going to experience this peace that Jesus is talking about. But if you can make Jesus the source of your hope and strength, if you make him your refuge in the storms of life, you can find peace even in a world around you that's filled with war and violence and hardship and unrest. Jesus is always near, but we have to know that he is near. So how do we do that? How can you have a relationship with Jesus that gives you this kind of peace despite the storms around you? The first thing is to find peace through Jesus. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you can't experience the peace of God because the reality is you don't have peace with the God who made you. Most of this message is going to be directed at Christians, and we're going to talk about how Christians can find peace in Jesus. But if you're not a Christian... That really doesn't apply to you. The first step you have to make is to follow Jesus, is to make him your Lord and Savior, to repent of your sins. Because when you do that, everything changes and you now have God within you. You now have access to this peace that we're talking about. Look back at our passage of scripture. This is verse 16. And he says, and I will, this is Jesus talking here, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On the day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That applies to Christians because we have the Spirit of God living in us through the Holy Spirit. And so we have access to this peace from Jesus. But if you're here and you're not a Christian, you don't have that peace because you're at war with the God who made you. The Bible says that you're in open rebellion through your sin. But when you accept Jesus, you repent of your sins, you make him Lord and Savior of your life, that all changes and suddenly you have peace with God so that you can find peace in God. Look at how the Apostle Paul says this uh, in Romans 5, 1 through 2, he says, Therefore, since we have justified or made right through our faith, through believing in Jesus, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. If we have true, life-changing faith, we suddenly have peace with God because we are now covered and made right or righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now we are no longer in rebellion, but we have peace with the God who made us. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, the rest of this sermon really doesn't apply to you. And your next step that you need to consider in 2024 is to follow the Prince of Peace, to follow this Jesus and making him savior of your life. Because what he did on the cross gives you a chance for eternal peace with God. All right, for those of us who are Christians, we have access to a supernatural peace in Jesus. 
it's a gift from God, but so many of us, we leave our gift unopened and unused. So how do we use and how do we access this gift of peace that Jesus gave us? Here's how. We find peace in Jesus. If you want to experience peace in 2024, your life has to be filled with the things of Jesus. Your love for him has to be greater than your love for the things of this world. As long as your primary hope, as long as your primary love are the things of this world, then you got to look to this world and your circumstances to give you peace. But man, that's a fickle peace. And it can change just like that when your circumstances change and it's up and it's down. But Jesus is offering us something different. He says four different times, if you obey my commands, I'll live with you. I'll be a part of you. And ultimately, I will give you my peace. True peace comes from a deep love of Jesus. And obedience shows that deep love. That's just how it works. And this makes sense if you think about it. I love my wife, Lil. And the way I show her that is I do my best, I'll sometimes mess up, but I do my best to make her happy. And I'm faithful only to her. If I say I love my wife, Lil, and I'm not faithful to her, what do those empty words mean at that point? My love is shown through my faithfulness. See, I think it's really easy to think about love for Jesus in very sentimental or emotional terms. And let's be honest, our love for Jesus should be passionate. It should be filled with emotion. But it's also got to be filled with obedience because that's how we express our love. And so when we're disobedient to God, it's more than just a failure of our strength. It's more than just a failure of performance or planning. At its heart, when we are disobedient, it's a failure of love because love is connected to obedience. So when someone says, you know, I really love Jesus, but I don't want him telling me how to live. That comes from a tragic misunderstanding of obedience. Our obedience isn't driven by fear. It shouldn't be driven by our attempts to somehow appease God. It is at its heart driven by our love. And and here's the hard part of this issue of obedience leading to peace. Obedience almost always comes before peace. And let me tell you some even harder truth. Obedience so often comes before finding any joy in that obedience. Initially, we have to be obedient because we know that's what we're called to do. We are following Jesus even when we don't feel like it. Some of you guys are waiting to follow Jesus more closely and to be obedient until you get this magical change of your heart when you suddenly have a desire to be more obedient but that may never happen. If you know much of my story, you know that I had a big life change about 15 years ago and came back to the church and came back to God. And and I realized that's what I needed to do. But let me be honest with you. When I first became obedient, I started going back to church. I started going to Bible study. I started uh, giving, you know, tithing 10% and being generous, doing those things. Initially, there wasn't peace. It wasn't joy. I did that because I knew it's what I was supposed to do. Then over time, the things of God became more and more important to me. And now I spend a lot of time and effort and energy and resources on the things of God and the things of church. And I love it. Man, it is who I am at this point. And over time, a lot of my fears have gone away. But but that didn't happen initially. When I started going to church every Sunday... I wasn't where I wanted to be. I was doing that because I thought that's what I was supposed to do, and I was, and, and so I went. But I worked really hard during the week, and I'd just as soon sleep in on a Sunday morning or, or go play golf. When I started giving 10% of my income back to God, that, that isn't what I wanted to do. I could think of a lot of things that I wanted to do with that money that didn't involve giving it back to God. But I did it. And, and I certainly didn't want to go to Bible studies during the week after I'd worked really hard and rush home and go to a Bible study. I did that out of obedience. And over time, I found joy in that. And then ultimately, that joy led to a different relationship with Jesus where I now find peace even in difficult circumstances. And my fears, many of them are gone. Obedience is the key to peace in Jesus. Here's why. 
When we choose Jesus over the things of this world, the things of this world that drive our fear and our anxiety, they become less important. The most important thing that will never fail us is eternity with Jesus. When that becomes where our hope is, then the things of this world don't drive our peace, but Jesus does. We have to be holy. We worship a holy God. And over and over in the Bible, Jesus says, I'm holy, you be holy. And we talk a lot about holiness in church. We talk about these different things that you're supposed to do and you're not supposed to do. If you've been around this church very long, you've heard us talk about some of these different areas of holiness. And holiness is really just this beautiful picture of what a Christian's life should look like. There's things that we're supposed to avoid. Envy and greed and bitterness and anger and those different things that we're supposed to avoid. And then there's things we're supposed to do. We're supposed to serve Jesus, give generously back to Jesus. We're to read our Bible and pray. We're to serve and love one another in a different kind of way. There's lots of these do's and don'ts that make up holiness. But here's where I think churches so often mess up when they teach on holiness. They tell you the what of holiness. They tell you what the rules are, but they don't really tell you why you're supposed to do it. And so you just hear a bunch of rules, and suddenly there becomes this mistaken understanding of what Christianity is, that Christianity is simply following a bunch of different rules, a bunch of do's and don'ts. And look, a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about, because maybe you grew up in a church or you grew up in a home where it was all about the rules. There were a lot of things you couldn't do. There were a lot of things you had to do. And all of that was wrapped up in making you feel really guilty. And maybe you developed a bitterness or disappointment or disillusionment with the church. The problem so often is that you weren't told about the why of holiness. You were told the what, but not the why. And because you didn't know the why, you didn't care about the what. But if you can understand the why, the what makes a whole lot more sense. Holiness isn't about behavior modification. It's not what it is. Holiness is about heart transformation. Through obedience, our heart begins to change where our love for Christ deepens and grows. That's what holiness is about. It's about deepening that love relationship. Because if we truly love Jesus, we want to live for him and glorify him and honor him. If we truly love him, we understand the depth of his sacrifice in death for us, and we want to live our lives as a sacrifice back to him. Then here's how peace comes out of holiness. It's really difficult to experience peace when your priority is sin. If that's your focus, you're going to have a hard time ever finding this peace of God. So often we want our cake and eat it too. We want the peace of God, but we also want to hang on to whatever sin we have. We don't want to give ourselves fully to God. We want to hang on to that sexual relationship that's not honoring to God. We, we want to hold on to that bitterness because we just can't forgive that person that hurt us. And you know how that steals your joy. We, we, we love Jesus, we want to follow him, but we can't give up that addiction to drugs or alcohol or pornography. We want peace while refusing to fully surrender to God. But here's the difficult truth. All sin is stressful. Now, some of it may be fun in the moment. I'm not going to try to tell you it isn't. But all of it is stressful. So if you're cheating on your spouse, there's worry about getting caught. There's worry about hurting the people that you care about. If you're cheating your customers at work or cheating your boss, there's a worry you're going to be found out. If you're lying, you're concerned someone's going to learn the truth. And my goodness, if you have envy or bitterness, you know how that robs you of your peace. That there is no peace in sin. Here's why the world has such a misunderstanding about holiness. God didn't make up these rules to just be a killjoy and take away our fun. He made up these rules, one, because it honors him, but also because ultimately it's what's best for us. It is what gives us peace. Finding peace in Jesus also makes means making Jesus your safe place in the storm. It means you learn to run to him first when things go wrong. Jesus should be where you go when things are tough. When you're hurting, when you're sad, when life isn't going the way you think it will go. But, but this doesn't happen automatically. 
You, you can't just suddenly do that. You've got to begin to rely and trust in the things in Jesus. You've got to have such a close relationship with him that it becomes natural for you to seek shelter in the storm. An example of this is, is finding peace in your finances. You know, one of the biggest worries and stressors for Americans is, is money. The biggest area that we fight about in marriages, according to, to polls and statistics, is money. It causes us a ton of stress and worry. What you will find is when you give generously back to Jesus, you begin to tithe on your income. Money has less of a grip on you. Let me tell you what happened for me. Before I began to tithe, I was really worried about money. I thought about it a lot. I would constantly check my investments in my retirement accounts, and I was always looking to see, am I making money or am I losing money? I was worried about a stock market crash. I thought a lot about it. But after I began to tithe, didn't worry much about it anymore because I began to understand that it's all God's, so let him take care of it. I don't have to worry about that. He's got it. I can't even tell you the last time that I looked at my you know, retirement accounts and worried about any of that because I trust in God that he's got me, whatever that balance looks like. I know that feels odd, and you think, yeah, preacher, I hear what you're saying. You want us to give to the church. I want you to give to Jesus because it will change the way you view money and it will give you peace. The same thing works in other areas of your life. If you give your career, your family, your health, if you give that to Jesus and trust him in that, those things will become less important and you'll find peace. You cannot control the circumstances around you, but you can control the lens through which you view those. When you have a trust in Jesus, you have peace even in the storm. The best way I can give you a picture of this, it's like sitting out on your porch on a rocking chair watching the storm, right? The storm is raging all around you, and, and somehow you're protected. That's what it looks like to truly trust Jesus. We get an internal calm and a peace when we have a dramatically connected relationship with Jesus, when we trust him in all aspects. Look at how the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus has to be the place you run to. I want to encourage you to cry out to Jesus. Don't, don't be ashamed to tell Jesus about your fears. You can tell him exactly where you are in your life because he already knows. You're not surprising him. You're not keeping a secret. He already knows. Cry out to him with passion and emotion. If you're scared, tell him. If you're anxious, run to him. Ask for protection in the storm. There's no award for trying to look like a tougher Christian than everybody else. Jesus knows where your fears are. So cry out to him with those. Give him your weakness. How can it be wrong to give him your weakness when that allows him to be strong for us? Go to Jesus. Make him the place where you run to. Then when the storm comes, because of this connection, it's where we naturally go. We go to the things of Jesus because it's already where we run to. It's where we rely the biggest key to finding peace, if you have a storm in 2024 that's different than you've had before, the biggest key is to start preparing before the storm comes. I have friends that have houses down on the coast, and if there's even news that there's a possible hurricane coming into the, to the Gulf, they head down to their houses and they start boarding up the windows and the doors to get ready. Sometimes they'll go close hurricane shutters that they bought years before the storm arrived. They began to prepare years in advance. If they wait till the storm gets there and they drive down when the rain starts, it's too late. We have to prepare before the storms arrive. Here is what I would challenge you to make your New Year's resolution going into 2024. Make Jesus the center of your life. Make Jesus the most important thing. And I tell you, you will have peace. It may take a little time, but you will. And some of you guys are sitting there thinking, yeah, I hear what you're saying, preacher. That's great. How's 2023 been? How's doing it your way worked so far? 
And, and if that hasn't worked, maybe try something different. Maybe believing what Jesus says, his peace I give you. Look to him for peace. The beautiful hymn, It Is Well, was written by a guy named Horatio Spafford. He was a successful Chicago lawyer back in the 1800s, and he suffered a series of personal tragedies in his life. His son died of pneumonia. His office burned down in the great Chicago fire, but it would get much worse. On November 21st, 1873, his wife Anna and their four daughters, they were on a cruise to Europe to go over there to spend some time. And he was supposed to have been on this cruise with them, but a last minute work emergency came up and so he stayed home to take care of that. And four days into the cruise, another ship struck theirs. And the ship began to sink and so Anna rushed her four daughters up to the deck and she knelt, kneeled down and she prayed that God would save them. But, but if not, he would prepare them for whatever happened. 12 minutes later, the, the ship sank under the water and 263 passengers died, including all four of Spafford's daughters. His wife, Anna, was rescued as she desperately clung to some wreckage. And another survivor, remember her saying in the rowboat as they were sitting there, she said, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. When she reached Wales, she sent a message, a telegram to her husband that said very simply, saved alone, what shall I do? Spafford would eventually put that little memo on his wall of his office to remind him where true hope for peace is found. And so he took the next ship to head to Wales where she was. And as they were crossing the Atlantic, four days in, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and said, this is the place where the ship went down. And Spafford was just devastated by that. And so he went back to his, his off, back to his room and he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. These words about true peace in Jesus gave him peace in that moment. And they've given millions of Christians peace over the years. This song is an incredible illustration of where we look to for true peace. It was where Spafford found peace in 1800s, and it's where we still find peace today. Let's stand together and let's sing this song together. But I don't want you to just sing out. I want you to think about what is holding you back from peace. What do you need to give to Jesus? to find true peace in 2024. Let's sing together.